I mean, you know, this is um, uh, the first time I've been back to... Uh, uh, first time I've been back to Wild Goose since the first one. And since that time, I got married to a man three times. Uh, the same man. It's just that marriage equality was kind of complicated during that period. But we sorted it out, and now we're, I think we're fully... I think we could probably never get divorced. We're so, like, married legally. I'm so excited. I'm a, I'm a storyteller. Some of you may have heard um, my work as a storyteller. And uh, I tell stories about very serious things. It's always hard to introduce myself, like, on a, on a train. Like, what do you do? And I'm like, well, I use comedy to talk about really serious topics. They're like, like what? I'm like, um, like about the dangers of conversion therapy. Uh, I look at gender non-conforming Bible characters. And I talk a lot about climate change. Any one of those things usually can blow up a conversation. The three together really is a nice, nice yeah, hunch. It was right after Wild Goose, about a year later, I had come home to find my husband, Glenn, weeping in the bedroom. Now, Glenn is not a weeper. I'm the weeper in the family. We have a very clear division of labor. I weep, he comforts, it works beautifully. And this was concerning, he's weeping, and um, he's originally from South Africa, and I thought, well, perhaps he got bad news about home, because I was going through some hard times with home. My dad was, had cancer and was dying, and so I had that in my head, and I was like, what is wrong? What's going on? He's tall, leaning, uh, laying against the, the, across the bed, and he's weeping, and he says, it's about climate change. I was like, climate change? When have we ever ever talked about climate change, like never. And it's not that like I deny the reality of climate change, it's just that it's just not my thing, okay? I mean, I'm a human rights person, I've been involved with LGBTQ issues, I just didn't see it as my issue. And I grew up in this Roman Catholic, Italian American family, working class, we didn't do like eco-friendly things. I mean, my dad did. You know, he like, you know, repurposed things and he saved things, but it was just because he was cheap. It had nothing to do with the environment. And so I'm like, what, what about climate change? And he said, well, new research has come out and things are worse than they expected and things are happening faster than they feared. And, and, and he was freaking out. Now, a thing you should know about my husband, Glenn, he was part of the anti-apartheid struggle as a college student in the early 90s. And he was part of the queer liberation movement. And he, knew, he knows that sometimes something comes along in history where you just can't be sitting on the sidelines. You need to be engaged. And he felt climate change is one of these things. And he, you know, and he said, here I am teaching creative writing at a university. I don't know what to do. And I was like, unaccustomed to comforting. I was like, they're there. It'll be okay. Or not. I don't know. I was like, we'll learn things. We'll join a group. And that's so, and I sort of left it at that. And Glenn is incredible at doing research. I don't care if you're looking for the best pupusa restaurant in Washington, D.C., or the most robust response to climate change. He's the dude you want on your team. So he went off to research. And I just kind of went off into my little queer performance art world, thinking we passed that conflict, that crisis. He then started sending me articles about climate change. And boy, they were dire, they were boring, they were hard to read. I, I just felt awful reading them. And I, I, I sort of ignored it. And then it started to hit me in my head. Okay, this is a serious issue, I get it. It hit my head, but it didn't hit my heart. And it didn't hit my gut. And when an issue as big as climate change comes along, it just can't be a heady thing. It needs to be heart and gut. It wasn't working, these articles, until one day. He sent me an article about drought. And in this article, it said, on a warming planet, we're going to see more drought, longer droughts, more severe droughts, which will lead to malnutrition, starvation, mass migration, political instability, war, things that we already see in the world happening today that have always been there but are bigger because of climate change. Now, this started to get my heart involved because I care about people. I care about human rights. But then there was a zinger right at the end of the article. It said, on a warmer planet, we're going to see crop failures and disruptions in crop productions, including a possible disruption in grain production, leading to a global shortage of pasta products. I was like, wait, what? Like spaghetti is an endangered species? Oh, hell no. No, 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 no. No, this just got serious. 
and I'm not, I'm not making it up. I wish, I wish it wasn't pasta that really got me engaged in climate change, but it's, it's just something was so, so part of who I was as an Italian American, something that was always Sunday afternoon at grandma's house, Wednesday night, when you, I felt happy I had pasta, when I felt sad I had pasta. I just had pasta all the time. And to think that this thing that was so central to my identity was at risk, suddenly it came clear to me that this is a major issue. And climate change is one of those things, it's so big, we need a foothold. And when we find out something we're passionate about is at risk, we can become engaged in a different way. I was so concerned about climate change at that point that I decided to take a year off to study climate science and climate communication. And now my work uh, full time is working around climate change and trying to use storytelling and comedy and podcasts to engage people in more creative conversations around climate change. And, and as the years have gone by and I've talked to many universities and conferences and festivals, I find two things to be true. One, most people don't want to talk about climate change ever. And if they do, it's to make fun of climate deniers, as if that is action. And I understand that because people expect that if they're going to hear a climate presentation, they're going to feel ashamed, they're going to feel sad or frightened or angry. And those, you know, who wants to sit in that? There's enough going on in the world for that to happen. So I, I, I understand a lot of people don't want to talk about climate change, so we have to be creative in how we do it. The other thing, though, I discovered is people don't need to become passionate about climate change. Because all of you out here right now, you're already passionate about a whole bunch of things. Some who would say, who would say we're silly, others people would think it was very serious. I mean, my passions are coffee and pasta and human rights and homelessness. All of these things are affected by climate change. You're already passionate about something that is affected by climate change. So you don't need to take on a whole new passion. Instead, it's about being smarter about the passion you have, or you may have a passion that because you have this passion, it is so needed on a time of climate change. How many of you are camping this week, weekend? Right? If you have basic camping supplies and you know how to camp, you know how to live for two weeks without electricity. That is something that people in America are having to do all the time now. You have skills and resources to bring to your community. And speaking to public health experts, they say, when there's a community that's close-knit and cohesive before extreme weather events, more people survive. And if you just love communities, that is climate work, building stronger communities. Climate change is a threat multiplier, meaning that we've always had storms, we've always had floods, but they're bigger, they're bolder, they're badder, they're nastier than ever before. Similarly, if you experience threats on a sunny day in America, because of your, your race, your ethnicity, your class, your gender, your gender identity, your sexuality. If you're having a hard time with housing, with police, with immigration, with passing over borders on a nice day, what happens when all hell breaks loose and there's an extreme weather event? It is a threat multiplier to the threats of social right, social justice and human rights that we have. And as people who care about people, the call on our lives is then to have bigger hearts so that it will also be a multiplier of empathy, of love, of care. Because we live in extraordinary time. This next 50 years will be, we will be adapting to climate change. It is here already, no matter what we do to mitigate it. And churches and people of faith, community leaders, are being called upon to do things in a new way over the next 50 years as we are stressed. And that is not something to fear. It's hard times are ahead, there's no question. But you are already engaged in this fight and it's about getting deeper into this work by just understanding how does climate change affect the thing that you're passionate about. I talk to people all over the United States and Europe and South America about climate change, and people ask, well, what do you do when someone is dismissive of climate change? I say, well, then I start talking about pets. Because everyone likes talking about pets. Even people without pets have a pet story. Maybe an anti-pet story, but they've got a pet story. And I've worked out this whole thing that if you can figure out how pets are affected by climate change, you basically understand how climate change affects human beings. And we can have this extended conversation about how to protect your pets in a time of climate change. And it opens up this whole conversation because they see it in a different way. I want to end this 
strange little set that I have by uh, doing a performance piece for you. I'm a performance artist. I play multiple characters. And I wanted to capture in a very short monologue, what was it like to go from that place of freaking the heck out about climate change to coming to a place of hope and determination, which is what I feel most days, hope and determination. And so I've created a monologue called The Five Stages of Hot Climate Action. And for each stage, I've assigned a different character to help embody that stage. So the first stage of the five stages of hot climate action is that freak out stage. That's when the penny dropped and I realized, oh my gosh, we're in trouble. Or as Dr. Catherine Hayhoe calls it, it's the oh shit moment. And for whatever reason, that, that, that stage, the freak out stage, reminds me a lot of my dad, Pete Toscano, who's originally from the Bronx. Holy guacamole, global warming is going to crush us. Drought, flood, pestilence, whatever that is. From the redwood forest to the Gulf Stream water, we're going to hell in a handbasket. After freaking out for a while, the pendulum swung the other way and I began to toy with denial. I never came right out and denied climate change, but I played with it. No, yes, of course, global warming, it is serious, but perhaps it will not be a catastrophe. I mean, we do not know everything yet. They may still invent something. Uh, this could just be another Y2K. <laughs> People of a certain age understand about Y2K, the freaking out beforehand. But I couldn't deny reality anymore. And what happened was I started to feel ashamed because I'm American and I pollute a lot a lot of the time. And I began this personal purge to purge myself of all greenhouse gases. And this is what that sounded like. So I changed all the light bulbs in my house. I bought those really super expensive, efficient light bulbs. Then I stopped drying my clothes in the dryer, partly because I couldn't afford to after buying all of those expensive light bulbs. And then when this radical vegan activist with really bad breath screamed at me, I became a vegetarian for about a month. But then it hit me, the despair, because I realized when I, we do the math, our individual efforts are not enough to really take on the scale of this problem. For so long, the consumer has been the one that's been told, you need to fix this problem by using the right products, buying the right stuff, while the people who produce this for us are never asked to do anything. And I began to feel despair, and this is what despair was like. But what difference does it make? I purged myself dry. No one seems to care. And even if they did lower their own personal carbon footprints in the sand, it's like a teardrop in the ocean, which is quickly acidifying. The very roads they build for us, the entire infrastructure, it's soaked in fossil fuels. It's like the trials of Job. Just curse God and die. I don't know why my despair voice sounds downright biblical. But then something happened. I met people like-minded who also were concerned about climate change and were engaged in action. Action is an antidote to despair. And I experienced hope and determination. We live in extraordinary times. So much danger, uncertainty, and fear, but this is not our first rodeo. Our ancestors faced myriad challenges together. The Great Depression, World War II, the HIV AIDS crisis. They discovered a lesson that we are learning today. We are not alone. We have each other to comfort, to encourage, to bind our voices together and together, dear friends. We shall do the extraordinary. Thank you.